You know, in these past few weeks, we've been talking about the study of all the things that we believe as we just finished up, you know. And so when we say these uh, statements of our faith this morning, we can think about what they represent. Uh, and so we, we'll just have a great time doing that. Uh, we believe in God the Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe the three are one. We are the church and we stand as one. We believe in the Holy Bible. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in the resurrection, that Christ one day will return to earth. We believe in the blood of Jesus. We believe in eternal life. We believe in the blood that frees us to become the bride of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you today, and we come in the name of Jesus, your Son, our blessed Savior. We lift you Him up today, and thank you for the power that surrendered Him to us from your heart that you would have him come and suffer, bleed, and die for us. And Lord, as we come before you today, we come with a great heart of thanksgiving for this gift of Jesus, for this great love that prompted the gift, and for the power that we have in our lives as we look to him, and we come to know you through him. And we have an indwelling spirit that seals our souls in the moment we trust him by faith. We ask now that you would open our hearts and minds by your Spirit, guide and direct us this morning as we search through the love letter of God that will bring us ever nearer unto Him. May our hearts be encouraged, may our lives be cleansed, and may our hope be everlasting. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. When I pray soft and low, when I pray this I know, God will always hear, God will always hear. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What I was going to do and Pat got up and walked out. Well, she'll be back in a second. Okay. Till such time, let's look on the left-hand side of the bulletin. I'll it's start there. there. Okay. Uh, beginning, beautiful. huh? The bulletin is beautiful. It is beautiful. Uh, have begun a study oh. <clears throat> in the Book of Romans on Sunday and Wednesday nights. Uh, Meeting in the sanctuary and have been able to distance up to 20 feet apart. Yes. Okay. Now, when this is all over and you're still distancing 20 feet apart, maybe we need to talk about showers. <laughs> A blessing. A blessing. Okay. So anyway, Romans is a wonderful, extremely interesting book. Um, so we encourage y'all to come be a part of that on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. Um, True Options campaign, right now we've got it running through July the 1st. Uh, sad statistic here that abortions kill more people daily than anything else in the world. That is, uh, that's a depressing fact. Uh, then the sad thing is it's been like that for years and years and years. Um, so our baby bottle campaign is going on through at least July the 1st. Our goal was uh, is $700, which I think we'll be able to uh, more than attain and probably surpass. Amen. Um, and if all that money just helps change one young woman's mind, Amen. it is more than worth it. Yes. Okay. Now that we've got Pat back, that's okay. Mother Nature calls. I understand. Speaking of mother, all the mothers here stand up, please. Happy Mother's Day to all of y'all. All of you. It is the most underappreciated job in the world. Yes. It is probably the most demanding job in the world. Yes. And Dina says the most rewarding job in yes. the world. So. We appreciate y'all more than you can ever know. Amen. Um, now that I've done that, uh, 
I and, and my mom and dad don't even know this shit because I haven't told them. Okay. Okay. As of this morning, actually it was last night, but I didn't see it till this morning because uh, I crashed early last night. Hmm. As of last night, I have been enshrined in and made an official ambassador of the National Sport Karate Museum. Amen. I had absolutely no idea this was going to happen to me. Um, myself and my good martial arts brother, uh, Mr. Chris Landino from my school, both of us were honored by Professor Gary Lee last night, who is the founder curator of the National Sport Karate Museum that's located in Houston. Uh, made both of us ambassadors of the Sport Karate Museum. Amen. So I apparently will have a picture of me and my name and everything in the Sport Karate Museum from now till the end of time. Amen. <laughs> Which, uh, great, great honor. You all know that my induction ceremony into the Hall of Fame in, in Las Vegas was canceled. We are going to do it online, but it's not going to be the same because I can't sit next to Chuck Norris. But that's okay. <laughs> but this kind of helps make up for it a little bit. Yeah. Um, we're having a uh, a big event in late September. Hopefully, we'll be able to have it in Houston, where I have uh, been invited to come compete with some of the best karate guys in the world. I'll probably be the only Taekwondo guy up there like I was last year, but it's an invitation only event. Last year, there were only 19 of us out of the entire country invited. So wow. I feel extremely honored and humbled and blessed to participate in that and then to be named one of the ambassadors of the Sport Karate Museum. That's, that's a huge honor. So uh, I got a lot to be thankful for. Yes. Amen. So, Amen. All of us do. All of us do. Uh, we're uh, uh, we made it another day above ground, so <laughs> we're another day closer to this foolishness being over with. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying it's not real; it is very real. I don't think it's quite as bad as what the government is forcing down our throats. Amen. But that is Satan manipulating the people in places of power to try to gain control over us. Mm. Okay, remember, when sick people are told to stay at home, it's quarantine. When people that are well are told to stay at home, it's tyranny. Amen. Right. Okay, we are smart enough as a people to know how to deal with this without having to be confined and having our rights taken away from us. And I just want to say, the bravest person I have seen all week long was the salon owner in Dallas, Texas that said, I've got to feed my children. My employees have to feed their children. And uh, no judge, I am not going to apologize for opening Amen. my store up. And wouldn't you know it, 24 hours later, the Texas Supreme Court said, uh, you're going to let her go. And the next day, I thought it was neat that Senator Ted Cruz showed up and said, I need a haircut. <laughs> And uh, so th th that is a brave woman. We need to all have the strength of character and the strength of will that that woman has. And uh, we are going to get through this. We've gotten through worse than this before. Amen. Okay. We survived the Spanish flu. We survived World War II. We survived 9-11. We're going to get through this too. Okay. So it's better to go into, and I speak from experience, it's better to go into battle with a sense of assuredness and a sense of self and what you can do than to go into it scared. Nobody ever went into battle scared and won. No. Trust me, okay? So have faith in yourself, have faith in your friends and your family, and together we're gonna beat this. And we're going to come out stronger on the other side. I personally believe God is using this as a time for us to reset our priorities, reset our morals, and to reset the world that we live in. Amen. And we will come out better 
on the other side. Let's all stand together and turn to number 485. find a copy of Dwelling in Beulah Land. <laughs> Far above the noise of strife upon my ear is falling Then I know the sins of earth set on every hand down of earth who vain to me are calling none of these shall keep me Full supply for I am dwelling in the Far below the storm of doubt upon the world is coming. I'm forbidden in battle, enemy withstand. Safe am I within the castle of God's word retreating. Nothing then can reach me If you love me I'm sleeping on a mountain Underneath the cloudless sky I'm drinking at the fountain That never shall run dry Oh yes, I'm feasting On the manna from a bountiful supply For I am dwelling God, I see contemplation. Hearing now his blessed voice, I see the way plain. Dwelling in the spirit here, I learn a full salvation. Gladly will I tarry in you, the land. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloud. Supply for I am dwelling in Beulah Land. Amen. Is it 
anybody else hot in here? Or is it me? No, it's a little warm. Get the environment under control. <laughs> Sorry. That's quite all right. Let's, for operatory hymn, let's all stand and turn to number 340. John with us as we pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful today. As we look about among us today and our numbers are small, but our hearts are full Amen. of your leadership and guidance of spirit and the blessing of knowing your son as Savior. What a joy it is this morning to realize that our name has been placed in the Lamb's Book of Life and that we can follow that light of Jesus wherever it leads us with strength and wisdom and assurance. How gracious it is to know that we shall see heaven one day, but even more important than that, to see him face to face and to see that smile radiate upon us because we have chosen him as Lord and Savior. Bless now our time of giving, bless the gift and the giver, and still within our hearts purpose to use it for one purpose only, the winning of men, women, boys, and girls to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. I thank you this morning for those who prayed for me when I was lost. I thank you for those who shared with me the gospel message. I thank you for those, Lord, who instructed me in the Word when I became a believer and the wonderful call of God to share that gospel message with others before me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
was me squeaking. <laughs> okay, I thought it was me. Yeah, I thought I needed to go home and get, get greased up or something. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get right on that. <laughs> Good morning, y'all. Good morning. I was going to sing us try to find a song about mamas this morning. And I thought, you know, as important as mothers are, I'm going to sing about my father. Amen. You know, cuz we're we're important. He he looked down and he found a mother for his son. And she was blessed among women. Yes. And and we honor that. But because of him, there are mothers. There came a sound from heaven Like a mighty rushing wind And it gave them peace within The prophet gave this promise The Spirit Come 
into this water There is a vast supply Oh, there is a river That never shall Always a hard act to follow. Just before the sermon, let's all stand. Number 244. I hope one day I don't have to say, let us once again have prayer for all our nurses, doctors, EMTs that are on the front lines fighting this crisis. Y'all got your high-speed boots on this morning? We got some, some distance to travel today. Let's take our Bible, if you would, please, and let's open it to the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 49. One of the things that we have to think about just a little bit from time to time is doing what God asks us to do. And it's so easy to get busy. We get busy with everything. We get busy with life. We get busy with everything that we're working with, everything that we're doing. And sometimes we forget the things that God has really asked us to do. And so here at Isaiah 49, in verse 1, it says, Listen a while to me, and hearken ye, me, ye people. For, for the Lord hath called me from the womb, and from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. He hath made my mouth a sharp sword, and in the shadow of his hand he hath hid me, and hath made me a polished shaft in his quiver that he has hidden me. And he said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Now today we look out across the Jewish nation, and they're not glorifying God, but God said there will come a time when out of that house of his lineage there will be a, a glorification of God in that particular time. We also look at verse 5, if you would with me, please. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered yet, shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. I want you to notice that in your Bible today. God is your strength. You can't have strength anywhere else. 
A lot of times we try to have strength within ourselves and we know that doesn't work. We can't have strength in mankind himself because that never does work. And there's no other way to do that than have God as our source of strength. Now, there's a couple of things about that God says about us when we choose him as our strength and as our Lord and as our Savior. Look at verse 13 of the 49th chapter. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth. Break into singing, O mountains, for the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. Now, two thoughts are in the last phrase. The Lord hath comforted his people. That means we belong to him by faith. And he will have mercy upon us because we're going to be afflicted from time to time. If a person has chosen Christ, and they begin to walk with him, and they think this is going to be the smoothest path I could possibly be on, they're in for a big, big challenge. Because God tells us in the Word, there will always be an active program against the Christian. Amen. That active program against the Christian is Satan himself. If Satan can trip you up, if he can slow you down, if he can even stop many people, and that's evident by the empty pews around us this morning, then we know that there are different things that are happening. Now look at verse 16. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands, and thy walls are continually before me. Now, God said, I thought enough of you. I've engraved you upon the palms of my hands. At any moment, we feel his heart. At any moment, we're feeling his mind. At any moment, he can look upon the gravings upon his palms. But then look at the next phrase. Thy walls are continually before. What are those walls? Those are the walls of our sins that stack up as Isaiah says and build a wall that we can't get past until we tear it down. We have to ask God to forgive those sins. We have to ask God to, to clear those sins out of our lives. We have to ask God to, to let God do the thing he is best at doing. And in chapter 50 there in the fourth verse, the Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. Not a person in this room today could not tell someone how to trust Jesus. Amen. Think about that. And what do we do when we tell someone about Jesus? We are speaking a word in a season of his need or her need, and they're weary because they don't have an answer. I was just reading this week, matter of fact, yesterday, that the rate of depression in America is higher than it has ever been. And the reason for that is, is because people don't know what to do. They don't know where to turn. They don't know whom to seek out. And so they are, they're frustrated with themselves. They're frustrated with the world around them. They're frustrated with the institutions. They're frustrated in all these areas. And it brings great depression on the people. But see, the people of God don't have that. I met a woman one time who talked about her depressions. Uh, and, and she said, I'm just so depressed. And I said, why? Why are you depressed? Well, she said, life's just not going very well. I said, well, are you hurting? No. Are you able to get up? I guess you are. You came to the dealership to buy a car today. Well, yeah, I've, I'm able to do that. I said, do you ever go to the grocery store? Yes, I go to the grocery store. I said, do you have any friends? Yes, I have friends. Do you spend time with friends? Yes, I spend. And when we got through, I said, well, what are you depressed about? You have more than most people have. Think about that. We, as believers, have more than anybody. Amen. Anybody. A Christian should never be depressed. Because God is our strength. God is our leadership. God is our director. God is our guide. God is our empowerment. Why would we want to be depressed? And see, when you stop and isolate and ask yourself some questions, why would I be depressed? Well, things aren't going real well. Well, so? Things have to go not well before they can get well. Sometimes you don't know if, if it's well or not because you're not focusing on what God's doing for you. As I look out across us this morning, we're all on the right side of the grass, aren't we? That's right. See, years ago, I, in, when I was in the car business, I had a little small framed picture and showed a beautiful green field. And from one, one corner, diagonally to the other corner, was a barbed wire fence. And there were these two donkeys. And one was sticking his head on this side and one was through the fence on the other side. And what was that about? The grass is always greener where? Over there. But it's not. See? The grass you wouldn't eat on the right side, the donkey on the left was enjoying. The grass that the, 
The donkey on the left side was enjoying was what was left by the other donkey, and he was enjoying. The grass looked just exactly alike. So sometimes we say to ourselves, I wish I had such and such, but would that really make you happy? Would you, can I not be fed? Why could you not be fed with where you are? Because God's going to bring you what you need anyway. We can't scale larger than what God will allow us to be, but we are the limiting factor. We are turning God dead in our own lives. When we say, I can't do that, when we say, I don't feel good about that, when they say, I don't have what I want, I don't have what I need, but if you're a Christian, you already have what you need. And because, But if you let other things impinge, you're going to lose that. Now he says, the Lord God, in verse 5, hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. So many of our Christian people have turned away back, you see. They are letting other things step between them and God. And the Bible teaches us, if this is God and this is you, and this microphone's between us, something's between me and God. I need to be over here, each one of us. Think about this. I hear a man just a few weeks ago saying to somebody who wasn't talking to me, but he said, you know, some of these church people are so wrapped up in God, they don't know what else to do. And I said, hallelujah. <laughs> and he looked at me. We was at the gas station. And he said, what'd you say? I said, hallelujah. What could you be wrapped in more than God that would be any better than that? You only got two choices. You're wrapped up in God or you're wrapped up in Satan. Well, he said, I didn't say anything about Satan. I said, no, you didn't. But when you say something that's not about God, it has to be about Satan. The Bible says two cannot walk together except they be agreed. That's our problem. We have to be in agreement with God for the blessings to flow. We have to be in, a, in obedience to God for the blessings to flow. We have to do the things God asks us to do in order for God to bring those things in upon our lives. And that's what happens. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheek to them that plucked off the hair and I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Who do you know described like that? Jesus. His name was Jesus, wasn't it? What did they do? They slapped him on the cheek, pulled the beard from his, from his cheek, pulled hair out of his head, and I did not hide my face from shame and they spit upon him. Now a man can get away just about anything with me except if he ever spits on me, we got, a, we got a battle. I may not win, but we'll have a, he'll know he's been in the battle. The Lord will help me, therefore I will not be confounded. Don't let the world confuse you. Every day as a believer, whether you're carrying a small New Testament, which I suggest we should do, or a full copy of the Bible, and things begin to come in on you, and they do all of us, take 45, 30 or 45 seconds, and just open it anywhere and read two or three verses and you'll begin to feel better because you'll begin to realize this is the God of my choice. I've chosen to be a believer. I've chosen to follow God. I've chosen to let God do for me the things that God says he's able to do. In the marvelous book of Luke, if you look there with me for just a moment, I want you to look, if you would please, first of all in Luke chapter 16 and verse 31. And he said unto them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now think about that. We focus a lot on the resurrection of Christ because that's our guarantee of self-resurrection. We concentrate it because it's our validation of the promise of God that he would rise again in three days. It's our, our true story of why the grave will not hold us. We'll be released like he in the power of the resurrection. But look carefully at verse 31 and 16 of, of Luke. If they will hear not Moses, that's the first five books of the Bible. So in Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you're going to find everything you need to know about God in those five books. And in all the books of the prophets, see, it's like we read from Isaiah. God poured into his heart what he wanted him to tell the people. They didn't always like what they heard. There may have even been some times when Isaiah thought, well, I don't fully understand why God's having me say this. But God has a purpose that we don't know. He's a lot larger in thought than we are, according to Scripture. Neither will they be persuaded if no one rose from the dead. And what was the first thing when those ladies came and told them? We talked about it last week when Jesus Christ was, they found a tomb empty and he was gone. 
And they, she came and told them after they had talked with Jesus there in the garden she had, and they said it was as idle tales. Idle tales. Sometimes we have difficulty in taking God's Word off the page and letting it become alive in our life. See? Jesus said, I'll arise. I'll meet you in Galilee. There was nobody outside the tomb. There was nobody in Galilee Wait. You say, what was that about? Because we don't focus and listen. We don't listen. It's easy us for us to get busy with other things. The moment you start thinking about Jesus, Satan will cloud your mind with a thousand things that have to feel like you'll feel like for a moment are more important. Nothing, nothing is more important than being in the Word. In chapter 17, I want you to look with me for just a moment, beginning in verse 20 and 21. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered unto them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. There's no way you can know exactly when the Father is coming. The Word of the Bible tells us even Jesus did not know what day he was going to pick to close out all of time. See? Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. We're not waiting for it to come. It's already here. The moment we trust Christ and His Spirit seals our souls, we're in complete union with Christ. And the Bible tells us that we become part of that experience. Now, in chapter 18 of Luke, look at verses 9 and 10. And He spake a parable of them that, uh, unto them which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Could you be a righteous person and despise others? No, you can't do that. You cannot sing, oh, how I love Jesus, and I hate the guy that lives across the street from me. Amen. You can't say that. You can't sing, oh, how I love Jesus, but I don't, I've got people that just, they're, they're just a, a nasty <coughs> challenge in my life. You can't say that. Because if you love Jesus, then you become like him, and he loves everybody. Amen. Think about that. There was a day when he loved you before you knew him, but he still loved you. He didn't love your, love your life, but he loved the fact that you had a soul and he wanted to save it and he sent Christ to get the job done and the Holy Spirit to will your heart. And this is the way God works. The Bible says two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a publican. In verse 11 of the 18th chapter it says, and the Pharisee stood and said thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men that I'm better. Isn't that what he's saying? God, I'm thankful I'm a better man than most of the people I know. I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this publican standing over here. He probably was thinking, what? and this guy over here doesn't smell good. This guy over here has no rating in the community. This guy over here who's the dredges of our society. You see? He said, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up as much as his eyes toward heaven. But he smote upon his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What a beautiful, beautiful prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He did three things in that little statement there. He acknowledged that God could do something about his condition. He accepted the fact that he had sinned before God. You see? And he believed what? He knew God was merciful. Does it get any better than that? Knowing God, where you are, and God's mercy will take care of it because you've asked him. God, be merciful, be a sinner. And that was the difference. It's a tremendous difference between him and the other guy. Now, I can tell you something else. The guy in verse 3 probably didn't have any money to give tithes out of. But he had something more precious. He had a tithe of his heart. Think what it means to God when you get last Jesus to come into your heart and to fill your life. And you're willing to give those things up for him because it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship. God gets something and you get something. God gets a truster, a believer, an acceptor, and you get a father and a son and a Holy Spirit. God is now putting, you're making life productive, not maybe in the corner of the realm, but productive in the fact that you've made a choice about Jesus Christ. 
we find a little further down in that 18th chapter in verse 17, Verily I say unto you, Whoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter into it. What's a little child mean? Simple childlike faith. What does a child do in their faith act? They trust. They obey. They accept. If daddy said it, it's got to be right. If mama told me, I can believe on that. And that's what we do as little children. Then we grow up a little bit. Maybe we hit that nine or ten, and now we think we know more than mother does. I'm going to tell you a little story. My mother gets smarter every day I live. She really does. As I look back, the things I thought she didn't understand, she'd do a whole lot better. And so as we get older, there are many people in our lives, parents, grandparents, extended family, business associations, that are really pretty smart if we'll just listen to the wisdom that they have. Now, the Bible says down in uh, verse 22, uh, a man is talking with Jesus about life, and he wanted to know what God could offer him. And he talked about the things that he had followed in the Bible, but he had not followed them exactly correctly. In verse 21, he said, All these things have I kept from my youth up. And now when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, Yet you lack one thing. And the man knew he lacked something. You know? See, knowing about the Bible is not like knowing the Bible. See? People read the laws of God in Exodus chapter 20, but then they don't do them. So it's in the doing, it's in the obedience, it's in the following, it's in the accepting that these things come to pass. And so Jesus said to him, you still lack one thing, sell all you have to distribute to the poor and have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And he said, he was very sorrowful, it says in verse 23. Why was he sorrowful? Because he was rich, he was rich. When I found Jesus, I didn't have anything. I'm glad I found him then. See, we have some real sad cases in our country today. We have many, many mega wealthy people, but they're very poor because they don't know Jesus. See, if you don't know Jesus, you don't have anything. If you don't know Jesus, you've got the worst retirement plan in the world. I don't care how much your 401k is worth because your retirement plan is not good. See? And when do we normally require? When we quit working. Well, really, that's when we quit living, isn't it? Our retirement plan is sound. We're going to rest in Jesus till he calls us. We're going to glow to glory and spend all of eternity with him. And so while you might not have any, any monies, you might not have any fame, you might not have any fortune, but you have Jesus, and Jesus makes the difference. Now, I want you to think just a moment with me about the fact that when we follow the Lord Jesus, great things begin to happen, you know, and we, we begin to see this happen. If you've got your Bible open, I'd like you to take it and go over to the book of Acts chapter 5 with me. Acts chapter 5. In verse 26, when the captain and the officers had brought them in, that's the disciples, without violence, for they feared the people lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council in verse 27. And the high priest asked them, Did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in his name? And behold, he said, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. There's a lot of, to talk about in that. I don't have enough time this morning, but in verse 27, they were saying, didn't we tell you don't talk about Jesus anymore? Didn't we beat you and send you out because of that? And we're going to have to beat you some more to get the lesson down in you? And he said, what did you do? We said, don't teach his name and you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring a man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other disciples, apostles said, answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Fellow, you got on the big cap, you're sitting at the big chair, you're on the council, but God is a greater council. God is a greater council. And him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. We the apostles, we are witnesses of his, these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to them that obey him. That's exactly right. Now go down to verse 38. And now I say unto you, 
Refrain from these men. This is one of the council members. Let them alone. For if this council and this work be of men, it will come to nothing. How do you know God's real? He's lasted the test of time. How do we know his, his leadership is true? Because he's lasted the test of time. The man says in verse 39, If it be of God, we can't overthrow it, lest we be found to fight against God. And what chance have we got doing that? You see? 41 and 2 of that same fifth chapter tell us this. They departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They had been beaten in the temple. And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach Jesus and to preach Jesus Christ. Not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Every day they went out and did the same thing. They just got beat for the second time. When you grasp hold of the things that God has called you to do, there is nothing you can't surpass as an individual. You can excel in your prayer life, excel in your study, excel in your excel in your service. Those things happen. But until you've got that in happening in your life, your exaltation is pretty low. Okay? Now, I'd like you to take your Bible and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and look at verse 13. For by one is capitalized Holy Spirit, are we all baptized into one body? Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be free or bond, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Think about that. Christ died for those who will believe. And once you believe, God's Holy Spirit seals your soul. And once you believe, He begins to guide you and direct you and instruct you. And we begin to call upon Jesus in prayer because that's the name that brings it all together. And we'll also notice verse 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we find these words. Now we are the body of Christ and members in particular. Members in particular. Think about that. We are the church and we what? Stand as one all over the world. Today, wherever believers are meeting that are true believers who've trusted Christ as Savior, wherever they're meeting together, they're part of us and we're part of them because we're part of the household of faith, you see. That makes the difference. Being in the household of faith sets you in the most favored possible position you could ever be. And let's look with that for just a moment. Let's go to the book of Ephesians for a moment. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul is talking in this letter to the church at Ephesus, the third chapter. Unto me, who am the least of all the saints. Paul never puffed himself up, did he? He said, I'm the least of all those serving God. Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ? I'm the lowest man on the totem pole, but I got the greatest job, that I should preach by God's grace the gospel to the unsearchable riches of Christ. The Bible says in verse 12 of that text, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith of Him. Think about that. And in verse 46 it says, that He, Jesus, would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Holy Spirit in the inner man. Oh, how exciting that is. But I got a little sad verse to read you in chapter 4. It's verse 30. Paul says to the believer, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. How could we grieve the powerful Holy Spirit? Simple. Just like we grieve Jesus. What do we do? We listen, but we don't obey. We, we say, yes, Lord Jesus, but then we don't do what He tells us to do. That grieves the Holy Spirit. When that Spirit tries to direct your mind to Scripture or direct your mind to witness or direct your mind to service and you don't do it, He's grieved by that. It's a sad day for Him, the Holy Spirit, when the people of God do not respond as they should favorably unto the Lord. Now, 
I want you to take your Bible, and we're just finishing up at 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter. Verse 4 of the second chapter says, But as we were allowed of God to put you to put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Verse 13 says, For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh in those that are be. There's effect in your life when you trust Jesus. The gospel makes your life different. The gospel makes you different. The gospel hopefully can make those around you different because we are different people when we listen to the gospel of our Lord Savior, Jesus Christ. And then lastly, I'd like you to look with me in 2 John, verse 9. 2 John, verse 9. Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. When sin rules your life and you don't turn to Jesus and you don't let Christ wash you free by his shed blood at Calvary, then you don't have a relationship with God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. So this is kind of what Jesus said. You're either for me or you're against me. Now think about that. No one tells me I'm against God or I'm against Jesus. But they don't have to tell me because we know, we see, we observe. We, we, we don't see that interaction of Christ in their life. We don't see that Holy Spirit leadership. We don't see that obedience unto the Father's word. That's the difference in our world today, you see. In our world today, as we fight this horrible coronavirus, this great pandemic, and we've lost thousands to this disease. But stop and think for a moment. How many people left this earth's experience yesterday who didn't gain heaven? Who didn't gain heaven? They left not knowing Jesus. They left in rebellion. They left in a position where they were not acceptive of Jesus Christ. And that's a far greater thing than getting COVID-19. You see, it's far greater. If we would just look, and I heard somebody talk about it a little bit on television the other day. If we would just look at, nobody's happy we're losing people to COVID-19. We're not saying that. But what we're saying is every day, we have tens of millions, perhaps even hundreds of millions every day that leave this earth experience and head out into eternity to one day face God in judgment and they don't know Jesus. They have no hope. You know, Paul said, if Christ be not risen, we are of all people. Our faith is in vain. We are all people with no hope. But he did come and he did speak and he did live, and he did die, and he did rise, and he has ascended, and he will come again. And that's the joy. What do we have in store for us? The greatest of all days of victory. Greatest of all days. The other day we pulled up behind a car and said to Annabelle, there's some people of faith, and she said, people of faith, I said, see that Dallas Cowboy star in the back window? That ain't gonna happen. <laughs> but they believe it is, you see? They believe it is. I guess the longest bet in the world, I think, in my own mind, will be in the next five years that Dallas would win the Super Bowl. It ain't going to happen. But they believe it, so they put that thing on there. See? Well, we believe in a greater. We believe in Jesus. You don't see our star, but you see the blood of Jesus. Think about that. It's positive. It's protected. It's guaranteed. It will happen. Nothing can stop it. Nothing. The devil on his best day cannot stop the victory of Jesus. Amen. You see, and God put it in this wonderful book so we can just go to it anytime we want and feast on it and read it, study it, pray over it. But most of all, remember this. When we sing that song, Victory in Jesus, I heard an old, old story, how Savior came from glory. He gave his life, Calvary, to save someone like me. That's the story. And just be reminded of that this week, you see that there was a time when God called upon you and how blessed you are to have said yes to the Savior. Lord Jesus, we pray this morning that you'd look upon us with favor, that our needs might be met at the spiritual level, 
that would excite us and thrill us with the joy of being born again, of knowing our Lord Jesus Christ, having one who hears and answers our prayers, hearing one who cares about us far beyond everything else, more than our families, more than our friends, more than our government, more than our world, because we have a personal living relationship by faith with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for living for us and dying for us. We thank you this morning, Lord, that you would rise and go back to prepare a place. And we have your promise, the promise of the Son of God, that you will come again. And we look forward and praise you to that day and that hour. We ask now that you look upon us with favor. And if one among us have need of Jesus Christ today in this place, this would be their day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with us, please. 294. this week that each of you here who are mothers will have a wonderful day and a great week and realize we have not the words to say thank you enough for what you've done for us. The leadership, the guidance, the trusting, the provisions that God gave us through you. I look back almost every day and think of my mother when our times were hard and she would say to my sister and I, y'all go ahead and eat because I'm just not hungry. We didn't have enough for three. And I didn't know at the time, but she was saying no to herself to say yes to us. And you know, God sent his son to say no to sin so he could say, I will save you to us. Think about that this week. The sacrifice of others for your benefit. But as much as I love my mother, I love Jesus more. He's done more for me. I'm grateful that I've had lived in a Christian with a Christian mother who taught me the things of God and made sure I went to church when I didn't want to go. I still remember the day that I didn't go to Sunday school and a knock came on the door and Mother looked out the front door and she said, your Sunday school teacher's here, well, tell him I don't feel good. She said, no, I'm not going to do that. You go answer the door. And I had to open that door. And he said, we missed you. And I said, well, I just didn't come. Then he said something I never thought about. He said, why did you just not come? Think about that. At that time, I hadn't come to Jesus. And I didn't go because I didn't have an interest. I didn't have a connection didn't know a loving Savior. But once you know Him, you want to come. You want to read. You want to study. You want to pray. And that's what I ask to pray for you this week. That you can fall deeper in love with Jesus. Deeper in love with His Word. And deeper your commitment to love and serve Him. For His honor and His story. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul.